Yeah. Welcome back to a new series called The Most Powerful Black Man of the Last 500 Years, where we talk about life during the reign of King Henry Christoph, commander in chief of Northern Haiti from 1802 to 1820 until his death. Now make sure you stay up to date. In part one, we spoke about his origins and the rise to power. Part two, we discussed how he solidified his power and how he established his government. We also discussed his relationships with foreign governments, particularly Great Britain. Now part three, we about to start getting into the main event. I know what y'all been thinking. During this whole time in his rise to power, what was France doing? What was the French government doing? Now in this episode, we gonna get into it. Towards the end of the last installment, I actually spoke about the different governments on the island that were established by the two generals. How Christoph's kingdom was immensely powerful and General Alexander Petron's government in the south was struggling and barely staying afloat. Christoph's government was criticized for its quote unquote tyrannical policies even though the quality of life was the greatest that it's ever been. While General Alexander Petron was praised for its quote unquote democratic policies but crime and poverty was increasing day by day. Let's get into it. Welcome to part three. Since some European writers have highly praised Petron's administrative measures, a brief summary of them may be given. He began by favoring the mulattoes, first restoring to them their estates, many of which Dessalines had confiscated, then abolishing the tax of one-fourth of the annual crop, and finally paying subsidies to the proprietors in bad years. The two latter measures destroyed the state revenue. Later, Petron gave away land from the national domain to his unpaid army allotting 15 acres to the common soldiers and proportionally higher acreage to the officers. Finally, he turned his attention to the mass of the population and placed the public lands on sale at such low prices that thousands of poor Haitians were able to purchase small plots. Many of them, indeed, did not bother to make any payment but acquired land simply by squatting on it. At the same time, Petron abolished the system of farm inspectors whose duty since the time of Toussaint had been to keep crop production at a very high level. This was a calamitous blunder. Without farm inspectors, many people refused to work on the plantations, lapsing instead into indolence and only cultivating their plots sufficiently to provide a bare sustenance. The proprietors of the estates, unable to secure the necessary laborers, were forced to abandon sugar cultivation altogether. Instead, they leased out their lands in subdivisions, thus getting what income they could from the wild coffee crop. Under Petron and his successor, who continued his policies, the Republic of Haiti rapidly degenerated. And before I continue, I want to put an exclamation mark on that. There's a reason why the modern Republic of Haiti carries the flag of General Alexander Petro. There's a reason why the modern Republic of Haiti resembles the Republic established by Alexander Petro 200 years ago that I just described. The Kingdom of Haiti established by Christophe, the Empire of Haiti established by Dessalines is not our modern flag, It's not our modern form of government. There's a reason why prosperity was reigning upon the territory of Christophe and poverty and crime was reigning upon the territory of Petron. The foundation of the country was created upon everything that he established. This is his country. The modern Republic of Haiti does not belong to Dessalines, does not belong to Christophe. Their nations that they established weren't even called the Republic of Haiti. It was the empire and it was the kingdom. And if you missed part two, where we discussed everything that Christophe built and established on his short time on the throne, a period of close to about 20 years, stop where you at, go to part one, listen up until right now so everything makes sense. Let's get back into it. Petron was probably motivated by the best intentions, but unwittingly, he laid the basis for much of Haiti's current difficulty. Separation from France had been a fait accompli since 1804, but Haiti was still regarded by her as a colonial possession. Thus, Christophe, as never wholly free from the fear of a new attempt to repossess Haiti, and as was necessary for him to always be on alert with hundreds of men under arms who could have been more profitably engaged in agriculture. Christophe had followed with the greatest concern the long and exhausting war which culminated in the defeat of Napoleon and his abdication on March 31st, 1814, but the obsession of Louis XVIII threw him into an agony of suspense. Since the armies of France, now freed from war in Europe, were in a position to deal with the former colony of Saint-Domingue. And since Christophe had no way of knowing what action the new French king and his advisors might take, he presented the position of Haiti to France, to his subjects, and to the nations of the world by means of three public announcements. First, his foreign minister, the Comte de Limonade, sent a congratulatory address to an agent in London with the instructions to publish it in the French journals. The message expressed a friendly disposition towards the French royal family, evinced satisfaction as the defeat of Napoleon and announced Christophe's willingness to resume commercial relations with France as long as the laws of Haiti were observed. Rather shrewdly, it was pointed out that Christophe possessed a large military establishment ready for any emergency, but that these warlike preparations had been made in anticipation of a new assault by Napoleon. 
Next, Christoph published a proclamation to his people on August 15th, 1814. He congratulated them upon the downfall of Napoleon, an event removing the fear of re-enslavement under which they had lived for so long. If, he declared, the French government is favorably disposed to the Haitians, then the way is open for a commercial treaty advantageous to France and honorable to Haiti. If, on the contrary, our eternal enemies, the French colonists, persuade the French to send another expedition, we will show to the nations of the earth what a warlike people can accomplish who are in arms for the best of causes, the defense of their homes, their wives, their children, their liberty, and their independence. As his final effort during this period of uncertainty, Christophe issued on September 18, 1814, a manifesto to justify before the Tribunal of Nations the legitimacy of our independence. Reviewing the events in Haiti from time of the abolition in 1793, he showed that the Haitians were loyal to France until General Charles Leclerc made it evident that Napoleon intended to restore slavery. He appealed to all sovereigns of the world, to the brave and loyal British nation, to mankind at large, to the whole universe, to witness the determinations of the Haitians to remain free and declared that we will never become a party to any treaty, to any condition that may compromise the honor, the liberty, or the independence of the Haitian people. Christophe indeed was justified in his fear and suspicion of France. No sooner was Louis XVIII on the throne that the old colonial party raised a clamor for the recovery of Saint-Domingue, a demand with which Pierre Victor Malou, a former plantation owner in the colony and now minister of the Marines, was in full agreement. It was decided, however, to postpone military intervention and to send out a commission for the purpose of ascertaining the actual state of affairs in Haiti. You know, they got to send the agents first, you know what I mean? The secret instructions to the commissioners offers another example of French tactics. The commissioners were to present themselves in Haiti as merchants or as agents of some mercantile establishment and to reveal their true identity only after they had made preliminary observations. They were first to communicate with General Alexander Pitchell, the mulatto leader of the South, to whom they were to promise a perfect assimilation to the whites and a participation in all of their advantages of fortunate honor. They were to persuade him that the Negroes ought to be returned to slavery or at least forced labor on the plantation, and that the former white proprietors should again take possession of their former estates. The French believed that Petron would agree to such arrangement for his own safety and personal benefit. Should he hesitate, the commissioners were to declare that the king will make the full weight of his power to be felt. Concerning Christophe, the French were less certain, but it was pointed out that he could easily be subdued once Petron agreed to their plans. It is evident that France had a twofold project in view to facilitate the conquest of Haiti by widening the breach between General Alexander Pichon and King Henry Christophe, and to restore slavery and the old colonial system. Late in August 1814, the three French commissioners, Laves, Medina, and Javerman, arrived in Jamaica. After gaining what information they could from the ex-colonists residing there, Laves wrote to Pichon, who invited them to come to Port-au-Prince. In the subsequent correspondence, Laves indicated the willingness of the French king to welcome back the former colony to France and pointed out that it would be better for Pichon and the mulatto leaders to enjoy rights as French citizens than to be treated as barbaric savages or hunted as maroon negroes. You know, they playing into that mulatto insecurity, you know. A lot of these dudes were abandoned by their father, ignored by their white side of the family. A lot of them were insecure. A lot of them tried their best to assimilate to the culture of the white man. So they playing into that, you know, that need for acceptance. You know, you'll finally be accepted as a European, you know. Ain't that what you want? You know what I mean? You want to be you wanna be with the Negroes? You want to be, you know what I mean, with your pops? You know what I'm saying? You want to be up in France, up in Paris, you know what I mean, with the French elites. You know what I'm saying? We know you want that. We know, we, know, we never gave you that. But if you really want that, come on, man. Sign them papers, bro. Sign them papers, little bro. They already know they can play them type of games with General Alexander Petron and the mulatto generals from the south, but it wouldn't go so smooth up north. In fact, one of the French commissioners, or the French ambassadors, I should say, ended up losing their life trying to play these games up north with Christophe, but we'll get into that later. Apparently believing the proclamations of goodwill on the part of La Veste, Petron carried on extensive negotiations. Christophe's conduct stands in sharp contrast to that of General Alexander Petron. On October 1st, 1814, La Veste dispatched a letter to Christophe through Montesquieu, who had long enjoyed Christophe's confidence and was one of the few Frenchmen permitted to remain in the Kingdom of Haiti. When Montesquieu returned to Haiti from Jamaica, his papers, along with the letter from La Veste, were turned over to Dupuis, Christophe's secretary. The letter was highly insulting. Christophe was offered French citizenship and a title in return for his acknowledgement of the King of France, Louis XVIII. La Veste warned Christophe that the European governments, including Great Britain, intended to unite their forces if necessary to overthrow all the governments that have arisen out of the French Revolution, whether in Europe or the New World. Should the Haitians resist, they would be annihilated. La Veste concluded his letter by announcing that he was sending Medina to negotiate with Christophe. Franco de Medina would end up losing his life, and he was murdered inside 
the Citadel. You know, I don't know why they went and sent that boy to play them stupid games, man. You know, I really don't know. You know, I really thought, you know, these guys claim that they smart. And but I don't know, man. It is what it is. Let's get back into it. When Montesquieu surrendered the letter from Laves, he demanded an audience with Christophe, which was finally granted. In the conference, Montesquieu enlarged upon the contents of Laves's letter. Christophe, if you preferred, could have the sovereignty of the island of Tortuga, or he could retire to France, to the United States, or wherever he might choose to go. I set no value upon my throne or crown, Christophe replied, but what will my general officers, members of council, ministers, and secretaries say to this? To which Montesquieu answered, destroy those who embarrass you. You must rid yourself of them as soon as possible. Christophe then called in the members of the Privy Council, which had been convened to deliberate upon the contents of Laves's dispatch, and revealed what Montesquieu had said. The first impulse of the council was to kill the Frenchman on the spot, but Christophe insisted that Montesquieu be allowed to leave unscathed. In November, the French commissioner, Franco de Medina, who had formerly been a plantation owner in Spanish Santo Domingo, left Jamaica for the Dominican Republic, where he made a stop to inspect his estates. When he crossed the border into Haiti, Christophe, having been forewarned, was ready for him. He was proclaimed to be a spy and his papers were seized. Thus Christophe came into possession of the secret instructions issued to the commissioners by the French cabinet and a full knowledge of the duplicity of the French. Medina was called before a military tribunal and interrogated. He not only confirmed the information in the instructions, but boldly revealed that the plans were actually underway in France for the invasion of Haiti. He was found guilty of treason, imprisoned, and murdered. Then Christophe sent the secret instructions and a full account of Medina's trial to General Alexander Pichon in order that he might be on his guard. So let's stop right there. General Alexander Pichon, General Henry Christophe, both internal rivals, you could say sworn enemies. They've established their own separate governments on the island. But once Christophe has seen the play, and he understands that the enemy is on the way because he still views the citizens of Pétion's government as fellow Haitians. He gave a warning to Pétion because even though we at odds right now, the citizens of which you control, those are still my people. And regardless of what personal differences that me and you may have, Christophe wanted the entirety of the nation to be safe and secure because at the end of the day, it was all of us who fought for independence. We might have been split down the middle on one side, the kingdom of Haiti, the other side, the Republic of Haiti, but Christophe still viewed all of us as Haitians. It was just a disagreement between two men. Let's get back into it. Pétion had brought all negotiations with Laves to a close. Whatever may have been his motives in dealing with the French ambassadors, it was now unmistakably clear to him that the French could not be trusted and that Haiti must prepare to defend her independence by the force of arms. In his last letter to Laves, Pétion asserted on the authority of the generals of the Republic of Haiti that the recognition of Haitian independence would be a source of everlasting glory to Louis XVIII. Unfortunately, for the future welfare of Haiti, Pétion went on to indicate a willingness to pay an indemnity to the French for loss of their plantation and their slaves. Now let's stop right there. Now we can see where that seed was planted. It came from General Alexander Pétion, the President of the Republic of Haiti, which is like I said, the current Republic of Haiti belongs to him. Everything that is going on right now is a continuation of everything that he established 200 years ago. When Christophe died, the Kingdom of Haiti died with him. It was abolished, it was annexed into the Republic of Haiti. And then after that, the mulattoes were welcomed into the Dominican Republic, they annexed the Spanish part of the island, and they controlled the entire island. So in the end, you could kind of say, the mulattoes did end up getting what they wanted. They were a minority population in the colony, they wanted to be at the top, they laid back in the cut, they got defeated, got smacked by the blacks in the Civil War, ran out, came back with France, came back, linked up with the blacks, declared independence, you know, the civil war popped off, separated, got their own government in the south. King Henry died in the north, annexed the north, went into the east, annexed Spanish Santo Domingo, and paid the debts of France in 1825, five years after the death of King Henry Christophe, and seven years after the death of General Alexander Pichon. So just let it be known, General Alexander Pichon, though he might have planted the seeds for that debt to be paid, his successor, his protege, ended up agreeing to pay that debt. But he never paid that debt. And Christophe never paid that debt and both of them were in agreement that they would not pay that debt and it would come to the force of arms to defend their liberty and independence. Now of course his successor, President Jean-Pierre Boyer, also the son of a white French father, he agreed to pay the debt in 1825 and that destroyed the country along with him continuing the previous economic policies of Pétion which were already destroying the country. And then you add in the constant predatory behavior of the United States for the last 150 years that also destroyed the country. So it's a combination of things that led to where we are today. And it's important that we examine these things to learn from the mistakes of our ancestors and to move forward when we establish future prosperous governments for our children and our grandchildren. Let's get back into it. 
Lavesse returned to France in January 1815 and was officially rebuked for having exceeded his authority. The French, nevertheless, went on with their preparations for an invasion of Haiti. Before they were ready, however, Napoleon's unexpected return from Elba in March 1815 and the precipitate flight of Louis XVIII plunged Europe again into war and put an end to their plans for the conquest of Haiti. Christophe employed the year 1815 in feverish activity. He not only increased the size of the army, but placed on a military footing all of the population capable of bearing arms. He made ready his inland fortresses, particularly the Citadel Henry, and assembled guns and ammunition. Petron too prepared for the assault. So great was the fear of France that relations between the rival governments went on to become more friendly. Christophe went a step further and proposed a union of the entire country. Nothing came of this scheme, but it shows that the threat of a French invasion tended to unite the contending factions in Haiti. Louis XVIII regained his throne after the Battle of Waterloo, but it was not until a year later that the monarchy was able to turn its attention to Haiti. In 1816, two commissioners, De Fautange and Esmongal, were dispatched to take over the civil and military administration of the island. This time, Pitcher refused to enter into negotiations unless Haitian independence was recognized. Christophe's summary treatment of the French agent Medina, which was well known, and the new commissioners did not dare to land in his territory. Instead, they prevailed upon the captain of an American ship to deliver the communications for them. Cowards. These letters were presented to the governor at Cap Henri, the Duc de Mamelad. When he saw that they were addressed to Monsieur General Christophe at Cap Francais, he returned them unopened to the American captain with a severe rebuke for being a party to this insult to the king and ordered him quit the harbor immediately. On a side note, I just want to point out, how come modern black leaders do not operate with this much dignity and this much pride in 2022? It seems like all of our leaders are just spineless nowadays, and this is why we got to study history to see how things were done when things actually worked and things were successful. Let's get back into it. Later, the French agents intercepted a brig off Gonaive on the western coast of the island and taking this opportunity to transmit their letters and a packet addressed to the commandant of the port, they were able to bring them to Christophe's attention. Taking no cognizance, Taking no cognizance whatever of his kingdom, the communication refers to the colony of Saint-Domingue and expressed the wish of the French king to extend it to the blessings he has bestowed on France. His majesty's only design in sending commissioners is to consolidate and legalize all that can exist without reducing from what is due to the dignity of his crown. Enraged at this new affront, Christophe issued a declaration on November 20th, 1816, asserting that he would not negotiate with France on any other footing other than that of power with power, sovereign with sovereign, king with king, and that preliminary basis of negotiation must be a recognition of the independence of Haiti, not only the kingdom, but Petron's territory in the south as well. So you see, Christophe is such a real dude. Christophe is such a gangster. Allegedly, him and General Alexander Petron are enemies. They don't went to war damn near half a decade straight, shooting at each other, bloodshed all over the border. But in negotiations with France, he's going to bat for his brother because at the end of the day, they stood shoulder to shoulder, side by side during the War of Independence. And he still remember that. During all those celebrations and parties and ceremonies, after independence was declared and everybody was on deck and riding with each other, he remembers that back in 1804, 1805, when everybody was still riding together. He didn't let the current disagreement that he has right now cloud his judgment of the overall big picture. Let's get back into it. Christoph insisted that no definitive treaty shall be concluded with this government without having previously obtained the good offices and mediation of a great maritime power, which will guarantee the faith of the treaty from being ever broken by the French. Neither the French flag nor individuals of that nation shall be admitted within any of the ports of the Kingdom of Haiti until the independence of Haiti has been definitively recognized by the French government. So in response to France, Christoph says, listen, ain't gonna be a French man or woman allowed within my territory until the French recognize my independence. This is coming two years after he already assassinated the ambassador that they sent to his territory. So listen, they already know Christophe on a different type of time right now, which is why on a second go around, they didn't even send nobody to his territory. They just skipped him altogether. They went straight to the South to General Alexander Pitcher. <laughs> Let's get back into it. This positive statement put an end to all further attempts by the French to gain supremacy over Christophe. The two insidious attempts by the French to regain control of Haiti caused Christophe more than ever to seek the friendship of England. He knew only too well that his country could not stand in isolation and he believed that his hope of winning a place in the community of nations lay with Great Britain. Then too, he had always admired the institution of the King, Lords and the Commons as in England. He was determined to eradicate the last vestiges of French culture and as far as possible lean more towards English civilization and he announced his intention of making English rather than French the official language of his kingdom and changing the state religion from Roman Catholicism and the Protestant even though everybody knew behind closed doors Christophe just like Dessaline just like Toussaint 
was big voodoo chiefs. Everybody knew all that Roman Catholicism, Protestant Christianity. That was just for show. That was just for, you know, the outside world, you know, to put on the face for the nations of the world. But behind closed doors, listen, it was a big Ugun, big voodoo chiefs, big, you know what I mean? Listen, listen, every single one of them, including General Alexander Petron as well, his wife was actually one of the biggest voodoo priestesses, quote-unquote, on the island, all right? So listen, the boys was big on the African spirituality, but they just never let it be known. And similar to today, I guarantee you, it's a lot of, quote-unquote, black presidents, black leaders behind closed doors, but they'll never let it be known. Let's get back into it. Christoph's attempt to demonstrate to the world that the Negroes were capable of creating and maintaining a stable and efficient government had not achieved much success. For though law and order prevailed throughout his dominion and his propagandists had written books defending him, in general, people in the other lands were either ignorant of the facts or inclined to laugh at his pretensions. The French journals in particular carried on a regular campaign of slander and mockery. He was presented as a vain and despotic savage. His monarchy, his hereditary nobility, his formal and elaborate court all were held up to ridicule, while his positive achievements achievements were deliberately ignored or deliberately lied on. Another thing we have to understand, if you're a black man and you're handling business and you're doing what you're supposed to do for your people, you have to anticipate that they're going to lie on you, they're going to slander you, they're going to mock you, they're going to run you through the media and destroy you. If you are being praised in the European media, in the quote unquote white media, then you are definitely a sellout. So when you see reports of how the European media in the early 1800s were lying on Christoph, slandering Christoph, mocking Christoph, that is a testament to his high achievements. That is a testament to his character. That is a testament to him being a real dude. Because just like all the great ones, how can we never learn about all of our legendary ancestors in school? They just either deliberately ignore it, similar to how they treated Christophe when he was alive. Let's get back into it. The Treaty of Paris in 1814, Christophe pathetically remarked in one of his proclamations did not even mention Haiti, thereby tacitly assuming that the French were welcome to reoccupy the island if they could. The delegates, moreover, in response to a demand from France, permitted her, along with Spain and Portugal, to continue the slave trade for another five years. Although Napoleon, immediately following his triumphal re-entry into France in 1815, abolished the slave trade by decree, and Louis XVIII, after the battle at Waterloo, issued a royal order to the same effect. It was clear to Christophe that however carefully they remade the map of Europe, the statesmen were utterly indifferent to Haiti. Christophe needed friends abroad, friends who would advise him concerning the internal and external affairs of his kingdom, friends who would recognize his achievements and publicly announce them to the world, and who would present his case to the European powers. Quite naturally, he returned to the members of the African institution, an English organization dedicated to the cause of the Negro, and in 1814, he entered into a correspondence with William Wilberforce, the leader of the abolitionists. Wilberforce saw in Haitian correspondence an opportunity Providence has thrown our way of sowing the seeds of civilization and still more of Christian faith, and he took up the labor with religious fervor. I know that not a day has passed that I have not prayed for Christophe. He was so enthusiastic over the attempt of Christophe to build up the Negroes in Haiti that he awakened similar feelings among his friends. Wishing to develop his schools, to create a royal college, and to introduce modern medicine, Christophe requested Ribbleforce to send out seven schoolmasters, a tutor for his son, and seven different professors. Amongst these, a classical professor, a medic, a surgeon, a mathematician, and a pharmaceutical chemist. Christophe also asked for farmers that he might introduce English methods of agriculture. Wilberforce not only sent the plowmen, but the plows as well. With the greatest care, he examined applicants from every walk of life before dispatching them to Haiti. Christophe's confidence in him was unabound and 6,000 pounds was sent to him for advancing salaries. Now, I don't know what 6,000 pound was back in like 1816, 1817, but I'm assuming, you know, it was big paper. You know what I'm saying? I'm assuming it was, it was big racks. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let's get back into it. Not long after he had sought the assistance of Wilberforce, Christoph applied to Thomas Clarkson. In 1815, wrote Thomas Clarkson in his unpublished biography, I entered into a correspondence with Henry Christoph, King of Haiti. The king wrote me a letter in which he was pleased to say that he had heard of my exertion to abolish the slave trade, for which he, in common with most of his race, could not feel too thankful that he had just abhorrence of it and would do all that he could to suppress it, either by subscription to the society in London or by anything he could do at home and that he should forever love the English nation for their generosity towards Africa, and that he would endeavor by degrees to introduce their laws and constitution into Haiti. Thus began the correspondence between King Henry Christophe and Thomas Clarkson. When the Committee for the Abolition of the Slave Trade was organized in 1787 as one of the original members, he became almost at once the society's field representative, and his documented evidence gave Wilberforce and the abolitionists in Parliament factual materials to present before the House of Commons. Christoph could not have chosen a more willing and devoted advisor. Clarkson seemed formed by providence for this specific purpose, and you may depend upon 
his being in earnest, Wilberforce wrote of him. Samuel Teller Caldridge once called him the moral steam engine. He was a painstaking and tireless worker. Two more different men than Clarkson and Kristoff can hardly be imagined. The Englishman was calm, steady, and methodical. Kristoff was impetuous, domineering, and ruthless. Clarkson knew that civilization advances slowly. Kristoff wished to accomplish in a generation the work of centuries. Clarkson sought the attainment of his objectives through the orderly processes of law. Kristoff created new laws to suit the occasion. Yet these two men, so far apart in race, in character, in culture, had in common their interest in the Negro, for whose improvement each was willing to sacrifice their life. No one knew better than Christoph the contempt with which Negroes were regarded, and he possessed an overwhelming ambition to lift his people to a level of prosperity. Public education has long been close to his heart, and in one of the earliest letters to Clarkson, Christoph wrote, My subjects inherit the ignorance and prejudice that belong to slavery. At this moment, they have made but very little progress in knowledge. Where could they acquire it? For in gaining their liberty, they have seen nothing but camps and war and blood and death and suffering. They must be educated. Every child born into the world must receive a proper education before I can realize my plans. We'll end part three right there. Listen, man, I'm telling you, listen, we got to get our bread up, man. Who got a hundred million dollars so we can go ahead and make the movie on the Haitian Revolution from the years 1789 to about 18. 25 right yeah i think those are good years you could make a a two-part movie and it'll be box office classics you know the first part of the movie will be the years leading up to the revolution you know what i mean the revolution itself and then i guess 1804 and then after the second part of the movie would be 1804 that's in the assassination, the civil war between Petro and Christoph, Christoph's rise to power, Petro's rise to power, France's meddling and tactics and methods to try to reconquer the island, you know, the battle between that, the alliance between the Kingdom of Haiti and the British Empire, and then, obviously, when the mulattoes came to power to dominate the entire island, they agreed to pay reparations to the French slaveholders, which were their fathers, and because they were never in slavery, they did not have the same feelings towards slavery as the Africans who were literally enslaved. So, you know, this would be an epic movie. I think it would just be box office sensation, box office classic. I know you feel me. Listen, part four, coming soon. Part three, yes, indeed. It's your boy, Nefakari Desaline. I'm gone. Reincarnated, I'm back in original fashion I left on a horse and came back in that ass And I left with abundance and came at the famine We used to be pyramids, now we be rapping Look how the mighty have fallen Used to be running, now we be walking When you be cooning, that's when they applaud it Selling your soul, your sons and your daughter Gotta come up in this shit They stuck in the mix, really my heart it be breaking That's why I'm stacking that paper and handle my business Pass it down in generation Talking about money and power and building a nation That's a deadly combination Never be watching the TV, they pushing the genders Falsifying information no, they got malice intentions Step in the room and I'm feeling attention Enemy watching, he blocking my vision Pay for the check cause I need my redemption Building my kingdom, I need to protect it Ready for war like a young money Congo Never decided the team is the motto Up in the crib and I'm whipping up waffles Up in the crib and I'm smoking gelato I'm chilling, I'm taking my pain and make it ambition I'm blessed by the gods, but I ain't religious I came for the power, they came for the bitch They make a no hour, they wage, I got business This shit is an art, and they can never be taught Selling my soul, I can never be bought Play all my money, I see you in court Run to the check and I do it for sport Babylon falling, I go to the source Packing my luggage and go overseas Shorty be with me and she so elite Shorty be charged and I'm calling her Hershey Secret intelligence probably gon' murk me Don't fuck with brands cause nigga I'm Haitian Say the wrong shit and you're smacking their faces